Thank you for coming um, to the MIT Center for International Studies STAR Forum. Before we get started, I'd like to just mention a couple of events that we have. Um, on February 11th, we will be talking about the challenges to the global economy with Harvard economist Martin Feldstein. And joining that discussion will be Simon Johnson of the Sloan School. And on February 19th, we are bringing to MIT Israeli architect Ayol Weitzman for a talk on the endless present. Tonight, we are thrilled to have with us Mia Kirshner to discuss her book, I Live Here. I Live Here is a raw and intimate journey to crises in four corners of the world. The book's four volumes explore such issues as underage sex workers, child soldiers, disappeared women, and the binding ties of common humanity. All material in the book is based on first-person accounts, which Mia collected for, I think, about six years. And as an extension to this project, Mia has been at MIT teaching an IAP course. <clears throat> Her students were asked to find hidden voices in the Boston region and, through mirroring Mia's methodology, create short videos. Mia will further discuss the vision of the MIT project and will also be showing the videos. Finally, oh, first I would like to thank Mark Cooper and Chris Brewer, who, <laughs> yes. who assisted Mia in her course, and um, we're just very, very grateful for their help. Um, and finally, for those who don't know, Mia's day job is acting. She starred in 24, L. Ward, and Brian De Palma's Black Dahlia, to name a few. We're just so excited that she was able to be at MIT. I think this is going to be an incredibly moving experience. Mia is extremely passionate, and I just would like you to join me in welcoming Mia Kirshner. Can you guys hear me? Um, thank you very, very, very much for coming. Thank you to Michelle and um, the Center for International Studies for having me. I have to say that um, when I got the letter uh, or the note from Michelle that MIT and the Center was interested in having me speak and perhaps teach this course, I was floored. I have to say, I mean, to be quite candid with you, I, I'm a special ed kid. I didn't finish university. Um, and it's a real point of pride that my passion project and this, a project that really became my heart, speaks to such a wonderful school that so many great minds come from. And I'm honored just to be able to walk in these halls. And so thank you for coming here today. And thank you very, very much. Um, so the book, I Live Here. Um, about seven years ago, I found myself in a, in a pretty terrible place as far as um, my approach to my day job. I was working on a show, um, and I had, I had money. Um, it, was, uh, it was about animatronic wolves or something. And I, I just remember having this sort of feeling that I was being swallowed up by boredom and uh, just completely disenfranchised from my own life. I just felt like I was sort of checking in and uh, really not thinking too much about what I was doing, who I was engaging with. And I was pretty appalled at my attitude, but I wasn't quite sure um, what to do to change it. How many, out of, how many people in this auditorium out of curiosity have felt that way? If you can just raise your hands where you just feel like you're checking in and out. I can't see. <laughs> can you stand up? <laughs> Seriously. Where you just feel like you're not engaged and you're not sure what to, thank you. It's nice to know that you know, you're not the only one that feels this way where you're just not sure what to connect to. Um, <clears throat> September 11th happened, um, and I was at work that day, and uh, we weren't allowed to go home from work, so I actually didn't see anything until I got home that night, any of the images. And I remember for weeks afterwards being utterly appalled at the level of my own ignorance. And the fact that in some ways I, I do believe that ignorance is a form of active abandonment 
and I felt like my, I wondered how my own ignorance contributed to what had happened. So um, I made a decision quite quickly that I, was, I needed to change my life rapidly. And basically, I decided that I wanted to do a book. And I wanted to do a book about perhaps stories similar to the people affected by 9-11, people whose voices weren't being heard. And um, I put the format of the book together. On a personal level, um, I come from a family of Holocaust survivors. And my grandparents are very old now. And they never wrote down what happened to them. And, you know, as age, as, as, as years pass, memory changes. So I'm not sure where the truth lies anymore. And I feel quite strongly about having survivors of trauma document their life. So the basic structure of the book was to travel to all these places, um, to have displaced persons write about their life, and then I would make a book. But the problem was I had no idea how to make a book. I had no, I have no experience in this field. I met with uh, my part, her, the men who became my partners, Mike Simons and Paul Shoebridge, who at the time worked at Adbusters, which is a uh, a magazine sort of on globalization and design, and I promised them that the book would take six months. And I mean, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, the research lasted roughly just under a year. Um, the first place that was chosen was Chechnya, and I focused on a region called Ingushetia where all the Chechen refugees had gone. Um, at the time, um, the word terrorist was, was really, uh, in, in many ways, being overused by the media, I, I thought, and especially when it came to Muslim men and women. And I felt like there was a whole group of civilians who had absolutely nothing to do with these so-called terrorist acts, and they were being isolated in um, refugee camps in Ingushetia, therefore, and I felt like their voices needed to be heard. I traveled there. Um, I met with, I had written a passionate letter to a gentleman named, named Joe Sacco, who, in my opinion, is the, uh, he is the leader in terms of political comic book art. And he's written a book called Palestine and a book called Garajda, all about the war in Bosnia. And he said yes to doing the book. And he met me there. And this man is really a master of his craft. And I have to say, Joe was the one that gave me confidence to follow sort of this unusual approach to the book, which is collecting the ephemera from the camps and having the ephemera speak to sort of the fragmentation of people's lives who can't be in their home anymore because of war and displacement and are sort of living suspended in tatters almost. Um, I had an opportunity to meet with a the war journalists, which have, have you guys, has anyone ever been in the company of war journalists and war photographers before? They're quite a remarkable bunch of people. Um, I sat, Joe and I sat in um, this uh, hotel that was like a bunker. We had to have armed guards, and so the machine, the guards with their machine guns were all over the place. And I remember these war journalists. Um, sort of compared, sort of tried to trump each other with their stories about their rubber bullet wounds and, you know, Africa was really bad and, you know, talking about Liberia and, you know, and they, they, they came, to, it seemed it was almost like, it almost was like bald guys driving Porsches or something. Like it just seemed like some kind of midlife crisis was happening in this, ho in this hotel. And, you know, ultimately I felt like, uh, they, they, they felt like um, Ingushetia was boring. They said it was boring because there was no story here and they weren't sure what story to bring back to their editors because there were no explosions. And that's exactly what I felt where the story lies is what happens after the explosions and how people exist and how similar we are to them and what bonds us. So that was, that was sort of a, I felt like the fact that they left and they went to Grozny um, to cover the story was sort of a sign that we should be in Ingushetia. The next place I went to um, was Thailand, but the story we were covering is in Burma um, and basically covering the genocide of the Karen people. And uh, 
they, they I, I absolutely was not prepared for this story at all. Um, you know, it's a, it's a wild thing to be sitting in front of boys aged between nine and 15 who've recently escaped from the Burmese army and who were kidnapped in the middle of the night. They were walking home from seeing a film and uh, they, uh, they were sent to recruitment camps, made to shave their heads, taught how to use guns, and they, they ran away. When I met them, they were being held in a Karen safe house and they couldn't return home because they, if they went home, they would be arrested for 20 years, but yet they're Burmese boys so when they were in the army, they were taught to kill the Karen, and they're now being looked after by the Karen military, and they don't speak the language. And I'm there, and I'm asking, who's going to help these boys? And what is the international community doing about this? What's going to happen when I leave? So the boys wrote these long testimonials about where, what they had seen, their capture and escape, and I submitted all my material to Amnesty International, and I'm very sorry to say that they did nothing. You know, what, what is the international community doing about this? No one can tell me what happened to these boys, and that's unacceptable. There were stories that come out of Burma, which is uh, the, the uh, Burmese army would go into these tiny villages and there's a practice of shooting dogs, family pets, so the dogs don't bark. Uh, rice fields were burn, are burned down, so people have to flee from their villages. And then they live in these camps, these squalid camps on the Thai, um, the, the Thai Burmese border. Now the problem with these camps, imagine that you're living you're, you're thousands of people living on this land, but you're legally not allowed to leave the perimeter of the camp, so you can't work. But there's no food in the camp. What are you going to do? So I'm walking in the camp, and it smells of shit and piss. Kids are running around naked. You know, the, the malnutrition, the kids' bellies are distended. And there, then the writing came back from women about gang rape that they had to leave the camp in order to go find work so they could feed their families and feed themselves. And then they're raped once they leave. And then the issue of pregnancy comes up. So the method of, I'm, it's graphic and I know that this is dark stuff, but it's the truth. The method of abortion is with sticks and Q-tips. So the sticks become lodged in the uterus and then they begin to bleed. Um, the issue of HIV, in, uh, and AIDS is uh, people, um, many women go to work in these brothels along the Thai Burmese border and women who don't use condoms um, have more money so they don't use condoms. Um, the next place was Juarez which I would say was the worst trip for me, the most devastating trip. I hated being there because I think it's, it's at Juarez sits on the border of El Paso, and I guess naively before going you expect, first of all, what's going on in Juarez is hundreds of women who work in maquiladoras or factories have disappeared or been murdered, and the Mexican authorities and the, the Mexican government has done very, very little to solve these murders. And um, what these women have in common is that they're poor and that they're young and that the killers felt like these families would have no legal recourse and no voice and the authorities perhaps were paid off to keep silent for over 10 years. Um, so I, I, when I went, the families did not want to speak. Um, it was very, very difficult to get the families because they had sort of, the, the foreign press had sort of, you know, jumped on them like vultures. and because they wanted to hear their stories and very much the stories were about focused on who did this to the women, was this cult, was this um, drugs, was it, you know, were they using the organs, was it part of satanic cults, but I felt like that wasn't what was it the, the story for me. It was like, who are these girls? Like, I wanted, I, I felt like, you know, when you look at the number of women that have been killed 
as a list, the names are overwhelming and they become, unfortunately, names on a page. Like you do when you read a newspaper, it's hard to emotionally connect with the person that's been killed or been harmed. So I felt like what I was trying to do was recreate Claudia Vett Gonzalez's life. And basically the focus of the story was what it was to be a girl. And, you know, upon learning about Claudia, she was, I guess, a girl like me in many ways. You know, she, 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 wanted, she wanted to be smart, she wanted to be pretty, she wanted to get a job, she wanted to be successful at what she did. And I, 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 my, my goal with that story was to humanize her. And perhaps through the humanization of her, try, try to, my goal is I hope that more and more people demand that the Mexican government and international bodies do more to stop this violence. Um, the last trip was Malawi and I had saved that trip for the end because I, I thought that that would be the most difficult trip because I hadn't really been to Africa before, um, sub-Saharan Africa, and certain, I, I felt like to be sort of the, the images I had in my mind were cliches. I imagined sort of vast landscapes of emaciated children and the face of HIV and AIDS was something that I had only seen on television. And I was so stupid and so wrong. I found when I, when I, I mean, when I was in Malawi, I, I've never seen a population of people that willing to help and these smiles, people who had, I've never, I've never seen that level of poverty. And these beautiful smiles that these children had were absolutely inspiring. And something interesting happened to me one day that sort of became a metaphor for this country and the whole trip. I, uh, I was, it's a long story that I won't get into, but I became separated from the group that I was in because I left and I decided that I wasn't happy with the way our guide was leading the trip. So I decided that I would just leave the group. Um, and I found myself lost on the side of a, of a road and I had been walking for a qu uh, quite a long time at this point and it was getting dark and I, my cell phone didn't work and I didn't know how I was gonna get back. And uh, <clears throat> I walked into a gas station and uh, I, uh, I asked for help, and uh, so this uh, young woman said um, uh, she would help me. Anyway, I started talking to her, and uh, she said um, to me, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm doing stories about uh, women and children with living with AIDS, HIV, and she whispered, I'm one of them. And this very unusual friendship formed between her and I. She. Uh, she invited me back to her house and she began to write about her life. So she comes from a middle class family. She became pregnant um, and the man who she was with left her. And uh, soon after having her child, um, she became sick and she was tested and she found out she was positive. And she continued to work at the gas station and she became sicker and sicker. When I met her, um, she told me she was breastfeeding her daughter and I asked her if she had had her daughter tested and she said no. And I have had this terrible dilemma, do I tell her I'm leaving soon? And basically by asking her daughter to be tested, I am about to change the course of someone's life. And is that appropriate? Will she be ostracized from her community? because in many cases, healthcare workers that I met there said that sometimes it was better not for the kids not to know because they would be ostracized. And I decided I would tell her. I asked her to go get tested. And at this hospital call, run by an American man named Dr. Perry, and she was, uh, the child was tested and she was found to be positive. Now, here is the, that period. The child is fine, and her name in the story is uh, Miriam, but her real name is Rachel. And I can say this because she wrote me a letter recently saying, I want you to know that Dr. Perry gave me a job where she was tested. And she said, I'm out with my status, and I'm proud, and I'm dignified. And I can't tell you, and her daughter is fine. 
I, I mean, I say fine, fine. She's, she's alive and she's healthy at this point. Um, and uh, I want to share something with, I also spent time in a juvenile prison in Malawi with my partner, James McKinnon. And uh, these kids, most of them are HIV AIDS orphans and most of them are in there for stealing Nokia cell phones, maize, some in there for rape and murder. Um, and many of them, no one's there to sign for bail, so they just sort of languish in the prison. And one of the kids wrote, my goodness is my wisdom, which is my strength and my future. And if a kid writes that in prison, that's, I, I was just so struck by that. My goodness is my wisdom, which is my strength and my future. And I left that prison and I made a promise to myself that I would do everything I can to, to help that prison because I was so appalled by the conditions in the prison. They had nothing to do. They have nothing to do. There they're, they're are these cells. They sit outside in the hot sun all day. They're locked in these cell blocks at night. It, there was a cholera outbreak when I was there. And so that's where the uh, I Live Here Foundation came from to set up uh, grassroots creative writing programs in some of the regions we cover. So our curriculum, uh, I'm very proud of it. Um, it's being, it, Chris Abani, who is uh, one of the heads of creative writing at UC Riverside and a very accomplished writer, um, did part of the curriculum for us. Um, and uh, my partner, James McKinnon, is launching the program in February and we have funding for it and hopefully this program is, uh, is sustainable because at the end of the year with the writing that the kids create um, we'll form our own zine and all proceeds will go back to the program the following year um, and then the goal is to do one for women in Burma who work in a brothel, I'll pick a brothel and we'll do the same thing. So now moving on at MIT and this project here um, so basically, I mean, I feel these stories are everywhere and sort of the philosophy behind I Live Here is to find hidden stories within your own community. So this was sort of an experiment for me coming to this school is to see, to see if it was possible for a group of students, many of whom I hoped had never used video before, and to see if they could capture these hidden stories within their own community. So, and I've never taught before. Um, so it was sort of a, the, the class was quite terrifying actually. Um, my first day, there were 33 students. And I have to tell you that uh, students began to drop out of the class like flies. <laughs> and the people who remained, these seven students who remain are these courageous, brave, innovative students who picked up these cameras and really, really did their best to find hidden stories, some stories that were right next door to them. And um, basically, the format of having two-minute short films is because you watch these films and hopefully you're engaged with the subject matter and you want to know more. And that's the point, is that this this project now is living. So I hope that people now, after seeing this, and it, the, the MIT community will begin to upload their own stories and their own short films. So um, I, uh, I would like to, I guess I'd like to now show you what these students have done.
What do you fear most? Being left behind. Um, being forgotten.
This is my son Lucas. He is from Mexico, where he has lived his whole life. He moved to Boston half a year ago, reluctantly, without speaking the language. Nevertheless, he agreed to do this interview with me in English. Dedicate everything to 
for doing that. And I'll be happy. I didn't know if it was just feeling good. all the filmmakers to stand up and please I mean most of these people have never made films before some of them were up until 5:30 this morning um, it was their first time using editing programs um, this man created this website that we're seeing Chris basically in a day and a half as a volunteer, Mark Cooper, who is a wonderful artist, mentored this whole program, so thank you. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, anyway, so this is the website, so now I hope some of you are inspired by what you've seen 
and you'll be encouraged to go out and make your own videos about stories that you feel need to be whole, um, told. And I, I hope my goal is for this, for MIT, to become a model for other schools to be inspired by and the capabilities of people who are not filmmakers but aspire to be and aspire to be storytellers. So my goal is I, I really hope that the students begin to use this site. So um, finally, I just want to thank Michelle Nooch and John Tierman um, for the Center for International Studies for having me. And thank you very, 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 very much for coming to this talk. Um, and um, thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions that you want to ask for, to myself or the filmmakers to MIT? No? Oh, yes? Oh, I think you should. Uh, during your travels, um, have you ever witnessed, um, I expect that you would witness um, a severe lack of medical care, like you were mentioning about the HIV AIDS case, or even just even daily things um, and not just the reviews. Um, so do you think that outside organizations coming in to uh, sort of intervene medically have an effect in those areas, or did you not see their presence at all? I mean, it's a, I, I couldn't, it's such a case-specific question, so I wouldn't endeavor to begin to answer without speaking about which place you're referring to. But the one thing that I see consistently neglected is psychological support. Um, which is precisely why the the why I feel like a creative writing program is perfect. I feel like these it's the f medical needs and food are the first things that are going to be addressed. But if if kids don't have an outlet in which to express themselves and to feel empowered by their own storytelling, that really doesn't give them a lot of hope. So um, that's one thing that I did see in my travels that needed to be addressed. Does anyone else have any? Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Yes, sir. I was wondering, what were you trying to accomplish with your tri uh, trips, like to expose the uh, difficult conditions in, in particular parts of the world, or you were trying to educate yourself? Or what was the purpose of your trips? I think, um, I think on a personal level, I was trying to find out how. I was trying to find the ways in which we're all connected. And I felt like the word refugee, and I, I think people almost have an allergy to that word in terms of my own, my, my own community. I, I think the minute you hear my community hears, or my peers hear the word refugee, they shut down and they're not interested in the story. So my goal was, was to, is to make a series of very accessible books um, to a larger audience that humanizes these stories um, and that creates, inspires action. And to have them speak for themselves, people that are displaced. Yes? Um, I have a question for all the filmmakers. How did doing this video change you? Uh, doing this video change you? Well, since I'm closer to the mic, um, I'm Shima, and uh, I think for myself and the other filmmakers, um, well, I mean, for myself at least, I feel like I've walked down many streets and wondered about many people, and through this process, um, <coughs> approached many people and got many stories. But I think, you know, one thing that it really brought home to me, especially with Jeff's story, was that there's this w world of gener generosity and spirit that is just waiting for us to say hello or to just, you know, just open up and then it just opens up to more and more and more and then there's just, there's just so much to learn from people who pass by that we may not have this week too. So that's what I Be open. Yeah. I think we got that as well, right? Devin, and just really quickly, I think that, um, I think that not only people you pass in the street, you know, have all these stories that you don't know about and, and that's, um, really important and interesting to find out, but also just kind of how divided some of our communities are, I think, is what I learned. Because um, I went to a community that I never, I've been here three years, that I never really went to very often. And I also 
if I didn't have to say that, I just wanted to make the comment that my, um, uh, the person who starred my film is here. She missed her film, but she'll see it later. And uh, and that's part of it, is that I don't think, have you been to MIT before? No. Yeah. So she hasn't been to MIT before. It's really close, and we just have different worlds and lives that we all live in um, in Boston. So I like, I think it's really great to bring those together and, to, you know, intersperse them. Any last question? Oh. I can add that uh, I chose um, somebody who I know very well, because um, he's my son. And but doing doing a project like this actually makes you just uh, stop and think really hard about how you feel about uh, being your son. And we're so busy, you know, going to school and getting dressed and going to the doctor and just doing the mundane things that. You know, um, sort of me, I really had to put me in touch with my feelings about this kid who I've known for 18 years. So um, that was very emotional for me. So, I, you know, it's really good to even do it with people that you know well. Uh, because sometimes you just, you know, we just live our lives in such a fast way that um, we don't really, you know, maybe even say something to the person that is so close to us. You know. So that's what I love. Thank you. Does anyone have any final questions? Oh, yes, sir. So this is going to sound more like a personal question, but this is the first thing that strikes me, uh, given the, uh, my impression of uh, the background you're coming from. So just I'm trying to imagine just coming from where you were coming from, like in terms of your career and the, that, the atmosphere, and then going to all these places. The disparity that you um, observe, you know, uh, between the situation that these people are living in, um, I'm just wondering how you personally settled this this great gap. How how you would think about uh, you know the kind of environment, the kind of atmosphere that um, you were coming from, and what your thoughts are right now about going back, for instance, to that environment. Right. Um, well, I think it's a two-part answer, actually. My, I come from a family of refugees, so in that sense, it's not an alien concept to me what it is to be displaced from your home and not to know what your home is or is your home, your, your family, is, what is it? Um, and my mother teaches English as a second language. Um, so uh, I grew up hearing stories about asylum seekers and new immigrants that work in her classroom. Um, so in that sense, it was something, a theme that was, um, and with my, my grandparents in the Holocaust and surviving concentration camps, certainly their own experiences were something that were prevalent in my, in my childhood. Um, that said, I think that the sum of the work on the book Basically, I mean, it kind of makes you realize or made me realize what's important. And in many ways, I think I stripped the fat off my life. I mean, quite simply, I, I think this, this experience has made me a, a better friend and a nicer person. I mean, I couldn't ask for any more than that, I guess. Does anyone have any final? Yes. Uh, I, uh, I'm from Bolivia, and um, uh, so I'm probably going to be going back for this summer. Um, and um, I, I know for a fact I've lived in Bolivia all my life, and I came here from college. And I know for a fact, I know so many stories, so many things happen in Bolivia on a first basis. So I wish I would have been in your class because I want to ask you for some tips, and because I really. I really want to go and film, and I have the support of, unfortunately, my family, my parents. And I want to know if you have any basic tips, maybe, of how I, I can go about to like approach people or um, yeah. uh, about making a short film. Sure. I mean, I'm not a filmmaker, so and the the point of this class was not a filmmaking class, but simply to get your feet wet um, in terms of. I mean, I, I, I think you should work with a local non-governmental organization in your country so you're safe. And so, because the worst thing you can do when you go to these places is go by yourself without the supervision of people 
that have worked with the communities whose stories you might want to tell because you'll, you might endanger your subject. Um, and I think the other stuff, these are big questions, so perhaps we could talk after. But I would definitely like to help. Does anyone else have any final questions or comments? That's it. Well, thank you. Oh, yeah. Yes. No, I, I think not with one last guy. I was wondering, uh, you mentioned the war correspondence. I'm sorry, yes. You, when you were finished, I wrote your yes. And I got the impression you didn't like them much, you know. I always was wondering, I, I, they look to me like they are um, adventurers, you know, and uh, I don't know how much to trust their war stories when they write to us. So. I don't know. You know, my father is a journalist, so perhaps my father joins those group of people. but. I mean, you know, they have a mandate from their editors about the type of story they're looking for and how can someone's life and experience be whittled down to a few hundred words? Um, I think that how can an experience be, uh, you know, you look at photography and newspapers and what's on the front page of newspapers is taken by a professional photographer. I think, uh, I think there's a very human voice that's lost in all of that. So, I, I, unfortunately, I tend to be cynical about this. Um, perhaps they are adventurers. I don't know. I think the one thing I did see was with this group of people, certainly I can't speak for this whole profession, but I did see they seemed jaded and they seemed very hard. And it seems like the more you work in this profession, at least from meeting these people and my, my experiences after this, you're kind of looking for a bigger, more explosive, bloodier story as opposed to simpler stories. So I guess getting back to your question, I think this is where the roots of these stories lie, is the simplicity of people's, people's experiences of survival, which I feel like are not covered in mainstream media as much as they should be. So that's it. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you for your time.